Welcome to The Black Table on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr. We'll devote an hour today, as we always do, to exploring ideas and subjects of general importance and special importance to African people and others fighting for the struggle to make and build a better world. Well, we are in the week of Juneteenth. For the second time in the history of the United States of America, there will be a national Juneteenth holiday celebrated. We are very excited about that here at the Black Table. In fact, so excited that we have lined up a couple of guests to help us think through the history of Juneteenth and the meaning of Juneteenth, the first of which will help us put it in an international context and help your celebrations really pop. And then we'll get into the deeper significance of Juneteenth as it relates to Texas, the history of the United States, and the future of the United States. So uh, let's start with some basic facts. On June 19th, 1865, Major General Gordon Granger, accompanied by troops from the United States Army, uh, it's by some accounts, as many as three quarters of them, people of African descent, men of African descent, rode and sailed into Galveston Bay in Texas and issued uh, General Order Number 3, declaring that not only was the war over, but that enslavement was over. And the following year, the first Juneteenth celebration took place. And that was on June 19, 1866. Now, it's very important to understand that Juneteenth is folded into a constellation of Emancipation Day celebrations around the hemisphere. Usually in the Caribbean, those celebrations congeal somewhere around the first or second week of August. In other parts of the United States, certainly during the Civil War and after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st became a very important uh, date after January 1st, 1863, of course. And throughout the South, as Juneteenth spread into Oklahoma and Louisiana and other places, sometimes that date might fall later in the month of June or even in July or August. And all of these together are emancipation celebrations that talk really about the long freedom struggle of people of African descent. And of course, in Texas, we saw Juneteenth, thanks to uh, a brother, Representative Al Edwards, become a state holiday in 1980. But of course, we're talking about it now in the context of the United States in a federal holiday, because in May 2020, George Floyd lost his life in Minnesota. But what many of you know, because we know our brother Roland Martin, the founder and leader of the Black Star Network, graduated from Jack Yates High School, as did George Floyd. Uh, what many of you may not know is that Jack Yates, the high school that uh, Roland graduated from, that George Floyd graduated from, Felicia Rashad, Debbie Allen, so many others graduated from, that school is named for Jack Yates, a formerly enslaved African who came to Texas like George Floyd's family did from North Carolina and was one of the formerly enslaved Africans who bought land and in 1872 created Emancipation Park where the first Juneteenth was celebrated in Texas, in that part of Texas in Houston. Well, when George Floyd lost his life in May 2020, the Great Reckoning began to flood into the streets of the United States and around the world. Two years later, or actually a year later, the President of the United States on June 17th, 2021, created a Juneteenth holiday. Actually, I was actually there for that bill signing and nobody believe that there would have been a national Juneteenth holiday had people not been out in the streets for a whole year before. And this little kind of symbolic gesture opened up a new conversation around race and around power, around enslavement, around national memory. And so today we couldn't think of anyone better to think about Juneteenth, the rituals of Juneteenth, the significance of Juneteenth, than a sister who enters this conversation from a very unique point. She is a naturopathic doctor, physician. She is an entrepreneur and institution builder. She is a five generation herbalist. She is a remarkable thinker, institution builder, cultural worker. And Dr. Sunyata Ayman, who joins us now, and in addition to everything else, she is the TEO of Calabash Tea and Tonic, uh, an institution here in Washington, DC and through the internet worldwide. She's gonna help us think about Juneteenth in a very, special and very specific way. I want to bring her to the black table and welcome her. Welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm so honored to be here with you. 
Yes. No, I mean, thank thank you. I mean, we, you know, we, we have a lot of, um, you know, next week we'll talk to Gerald Horn, our friend Gerald Horn, who's going to walk us through the history of Texas and Juneteenth and all that. But today we were like, OK, everybody's going to be celebrating. And of course, our people have been celebrating all along in Texas with the barbecues and the foot races and the and the, and the pageants and the games. And but the food. Food is significant in all human rituals. And people now who are stumbling around in the stores, trying, well, I, I want to celebrate Juneteenth or I want to honor Juneteenth. What do they eat? I mean, what do they do? We said, you know what, let's get Dr. Ahmed to talk about this because um, you published uh, recently an article in the Washington Post, uh, actually, I guess it was uh, last week, where you talk about the significance of some of the Juneteenth foods as they relate to the celebration in the culture, and particularly the concept of these red foods but we, we want to talk about that in in the next segment what i hope you'll share with us today uh in this first segment a little bit is more about yourself i mean you know we know you obviously from a lot of work uh whether it be cnn or the washington post with all the institution building you've done your presence but tell us a little bit about dr sunyata Ahmed. uh wow um what an intro i appreciate that <laughs> uh <laughs> I mean, I I am a fifth generation herbalist and the descendant of Maroons, uh, two sets of Maroons. Um, Maroons from the Great Dismal Swamp here in the United States and Maroons that are Jamaican. And um, I, I believe that that kind of puts me in like this really awkward, strange space of uh, being a, a cultural custodian. And as much as I tried to run from that as a young person, I was like, I don't want to do this work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I grew up in a health food store. My dad is an, an ethnobotanist by training, um, who also trained in Cuba in in um, in school there, uh, at university in in university in Cuba at a time when Cuba was extending invitations to uh, high school and college students to come there for university. And uh, the last thing in my life I wanted as a young person was to do this work, was to be an herbalist, was to, uh, you know, be centered in building community. And I know that may sound strange, but when your parents are activists, it's like, oh, here we go. Another march. Or <laughs> I hope you don't mind, because I know we had you a couple of years ago talk to the freshman class at Howard University and 1500 students that you talked to. I mean, everybody was wrapped in attention and their parents and their parents, parents know your family because it wasn't just any health food store, wasn't just any herbal store. Say a little bit about that practice that you I mean, you were literally born into one of the most important institutions, not only in New York City, but really in the diaspora as it relates to this work. Could you say a little bit more about growing up in that particular store and what that work looked like? Um, I was definitely the free labor um, <laughs> in my <laughs> in my parents shop. And that's to say that's what community is about. A lot of times um, the spirit of entrepreneurship is the seeds are sown. And that's what we talk about when we talk about uh, self-sufficiency and revolution and um, freedom as as is celebrated during Juneteenth is um, the, our connections to our community, our business community, et cetera. I mean, that's where we see the dust ups, right? Like in, in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, and you know, is uh, in North Carolina is when we are connected through business. And so growing up, uh, as I said, you know, not realizing how pivotal my parents and the folks that continued that work would be in Harlem. Um, my dad opened in the early 70s uh, a place called Black Pyramid. Uh, I guess Pyramid wasn't black enough. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, either way, it became legendary. <laughs> when you say Black Pyramid, certain people start, oh, really? Oh, yeah. So right. And, and the offshoot of that was Tree of Life. Yes. Um, and so my my dad's partner and my dad and, and my cousins um, sort of shifted that focus into uh, a full fledged bookstore. Um, they figured, you know, if you're feeding people's minds, you're going to feed their bodies. There has to be this shift in consciousness. And so that store existed for maybe 25 years and then Tree of Life up until, you know, not so long ago. Um, and these became 
bastions in the community. Um, my dad opened three stores ultimately. And um, what I find is that people do come to me and say, oh, I know that place or I bought books there or I, I, ate, I ate at the juice bar in there. Or I, and it is, it is only as I became um, a, a little bit older young adult that I realized uh, the importance of that particular thing in which I had pushed away from me. So every time I thought I was getting out, they pulled me back in. <laughs> so that, well, you so, know what? I, I think what we might want to do now, why don't we do this? Why don't we pause and come back in the second block and then we can get into not only your apprenticeships, but then open that into how when we're going to have this conversation about the significance of the Juneteenth foods, you know, all of this background and all this momentum you are now able to empty into these rituals and help us understand uh what we're actually putting in our bodies for this for this ritual holiday so we'll be back in a moment with uh, our guest dr, dr. sumyata Amin, the ceo of calabash tea and tonic and the history of juneteenth through the foods of juneteenth back in a moment at the black tea Back to the Black Table. I'm Greg Carr here on the Black Star Network, and uh, Dr. Amin, our guest, Sunyata Amin. When we paused, uh, you were telling us how you tried to get out, but they pulled you back in. I love you. you, you all, I mean, I've I've seen you lecture and have interaction with audiences where you talk about, you know, that apprenticeship literally stains your fingers. I mean, you you're working in in. in I mean, you know, talk to us a little bit about. I that. was the Golden Seal girl. You know, I was the person in charge of bagging, you know, ginger and golden seal and and uh, turmeric. And uh, so sometimes I'd go to school and my fingertips would be like yellow or <laughs> red. And people are like, what the heck kind of thing are you doing? Yeah, do we need to call and, uh, children's services? Uh, what's wrong with this child's finger? <laughs> <laughs> no, what's going on? <laughs> well, even the other students were like, I think, you know, I heard that that she's that, you know, they got some stuff in there. That's They got roots. They got roots. Oh, Lord. So they, they had you pay for a witch as a child. But, you know, I, I never, students always talk about this when they mention you. They say, you told them you you almost never got a cold or never got I, a cold. I still have yet to remember a cold I got or sick in any capacity. You know, my classmates would get full-blown, uh, what do you call it, chicken pox, different things would go around. I just never got sick. And um, I attribute that to probably breathing in all those fumes of things as the child labor. <laughs> <laughs> no, right but now, our, the folks who work at Calabash with me never get, and they don't notice it until I said, did you notice that you haven't been sick this whole year? And they're like, oh, you're right. <laughs> And I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> but you're exactly. I mean, but, but, you know, and then, of course, you go on to get professional training. You are a licensed naturopathic physician. And, yes. and I think about the fact that you always talk about decolonizing our tongues. 
And part of that is restoring us to our natural health. I mean, people think, well, I eat this because it tastes good. But, but you always remind us, and I'm there because, you know, I'm drinking out of my decolonize your tongue. Oh, uh, hey. well, you know, I got a rep, you know, got a rep. I got, the, I got the maroons. Oh, the maroons. They, uh, look, I, lo- look, I started to rock my original maroon five joint because I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later in terms of foods and resistance or so even uh-huh. now. But, you know, you're constantly reminding us that what we put in our bodies, you know, makes all the difference. And so, you know, could you talk to us a little bit about the significance of food in the body and particularly for people of African descent, as we begin to think about those formerly enslaved people who never stopped practicing health uh, with the foods that they ate? Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought this up. And so many of your students, by the way, from Howard come into the shop all the time and they say, Dr. Carr said, you're a whole witch. And I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) and the way that that relates in the decolonizing of our tongues is reclaiming lots of the things that are our traditions, that it is possible that we still say, we do, we say, oh, that child, he's been here before. Oh, I saw a butterfly. That's my grandmother coming back to tell me something. I mean, we we have symbolism, we have connection to nature. And within that, um, you know, during the MAFA, during the Holocaust of being transported, millions of us uh, in that transatlantic slave trade, um, as enslaved people, one of the ways that we could connect to home was the knowledge of herbal medicine. The the fact that um, nature, not just the herbs, but but nature itself connects us mind, body, and spirit to who we really are at our essence. And that's why the food is so important because that's the way we connect internally with the way we relate to nature. And so, so many things were taken from us. And even in places where we were forbidden to drum or to practice um, traditional Yoruba ceremony or traditional Akan things, or we, we must remember many of us were Muslim, um, being ta- you know, taken many, many Imams and many Sufis. And, you know, that in the new world, um, in general in life, if you think about it, Everything you can do to a person, you can try to control a person. But one thing that you can't really control is food. People decide they're not going to eat or people uh, who feel put upon decide I'm not eating or I am eating my feelings or I'm not going to eat because I feel a certain way. It is something you can control as an individual. Mm. So one of one of the ways that we um, take personal power, even if it's in a disordered fashion, even as as modern people in disorder is the control of what we eat or do not eat. Mm. And that is a revolutionary act for better or worse. It is a matter of taking back resting control. And so when we talk about what we ate from a diasporic perspective post uh, transatlantic slavery or even during that time, right? Because that was hundreds of years um, in the making that we could uh, approximate what we were used to before and it's its own act of resistance, it's its own decolonizing or resistance to colonization that we're exercising at that point. So if we think about the Maroons, Dr. Carr, I mean, this is one of your uh, loves and specialties, Mm -hmm. our connection, you know, Queen Nanny, who's on our cup, right? Or or, or, um, um, Zumbi, Kojo, you know, Makandal, Dutty Bookman, we talk about how many of them, there's the success of their revolutionary acts, um, Harriet Tubman, lots of folks that it had to do with their responsibility to nature and our connectivity to nature Mm. that allowed them. And so it's said that, oh, this one practiced voodoo and they had herbs at their disposal and this one gave herbs to their troops so that they were emboldened and strengthened. This is the food they ate. This is the sacrifices they left to the African spirits that 
um, are relate are related to food for us. There's no way to separate it. And so in that context, as we even come to things like Juneteenth, as we come to other celebratory uh, uh, things that we hold in our communities, food is absolutely pivotal. Mm. Well, well, let's in fact let's let's continue that momentum as, as you're talking, and of course. Uh, as you talk about all those places you brought in Jamaica and Cuba and Haiti and, 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 and put that right where we can now see this momentum of resistance literally through with, with, with the foods that we ate. In the article you wrote uh, on the 15th of June in, in the Washington Post, one of the things you talked about. That comes out tomorrow, actually. What you guys got was the preview. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's perfect. So then that's right in the rhythm then. All right. So you all in the uh, food section tomorrow. On, thir- on on Thursday, the on Thursday, um, it comes out on Wednesday. Wednesday, uh, June fifteenth. Yes. So by the time, okay, so by the time folks are seeing this, it will have already come out. So you all can now access the Washington Post and yes. see this article. And so in it, you you talk about several of those uh, those herbs, those plants, and you focus in on hibiscus. And uh, you write hibiscus plants with a lot of the other botanicals that come from Africa, like ginger and the various spices, as you said, came with us on those ships. And they not only allowed us to continue our practices, they continued to heal us. And of course, you know, coming out of the Caribbean, as you do, you also write about how over the last decade plus that sorrel that so many people in the diaspora enjoy you know, it has medicinal benefits. Could you talk a little bit about what makes the red and some of these red drinks that we consume? Not all of them, as we'll talk about in a minute, but some of them, what makes them so powerful? And talk about some of those, some of those herbs. That's such a great question. Um, red is a significant ancestral color for us. In many of our West African traditions, red symbolizes ancestral connection and power through blood through blood connections. And that connection doesn't have to be people you're related to, is symbolic. And so when you talk about Shango, when you talk about Alegua, who's actually, whose bracelets I have on now, both both of those <laughs> deities. But, um, you know, we talk about red being a color of power. Um, when people get married, they're often wearing red, not white. Um, people are, um, there is there is red involved in ceremony and palm wine and cola. Um, I know Coca Cola made this formula that people associate cola with brown, but that's because it's been dyed brown. Um, but the truth is that cola nut, it, you know, you have white colas, red cola nuts. It's um, those are associated with divination, with asking the creator, what's the next step, or how do I go forward, and. Wait, 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 before, before we go, I, I don't want to dwell on this, but just so folk catch that Coca-Cola, like we drink Coca-Cola, that has roots in the Caribbean as well? I mean, this has roots in Africa. Wow. And, you know, when we talk about a drink like that, we're talking about the fact that it's dyed brown from sugar product. It is sweet from sugar product. It is um, spiced seasoned with cola nuts, which are traditional to us in West Africa, right? It It is every, the um, even when they used to put cocaine in it, it was coca leaves that are indigenous to, you know, South America um, until they got busted with that. And they were like, you can't put that in. <laughs> okay, I didn't want to, look, hey, you all, Dr. Amon's coming back to the black table. I'm just going to claim that right now because we're going to have to do a whole thing just around Coca-Cola and imperialism and Africa and the Caribbean. I didn't want to I just wanted to, I didn't want anybody to miss that footnote. So that's a teaser for the next time you come. Anyway, I didn't stop your momentum. OK, so 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 no, I love that. Um, I would love to come back and just talk about the colonization of our indigenous foods that are now superfoods in whole foods and, you know, just and and just coming forward on that. So. Um, I, I love that you've asked this question and our interconnectivity, wherever you see that hibiscus plant and these other indigenous uh, West African plants, wherever they're growing, wherever you spy them, you're seeing Africa. It's the thumbprint. Oh. It's the indelible thumbprint because, you know, hibiscus stains whatever it touches and it has it has left a fingerprint, a, a watermark of um, capitalism, imperialism, enslavement, and resistance. It's leaving its mark. 
well, you know what then? I think that that's actually a perfect place for us to pause. And when we come back in our next segment, let's pick up with that red drink. Because just like Juneteenth, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of debate and discussion saying, well, Juneteenth belongs to us as black people. It's not American. It's not everybody in America. It's enslaved people. And then people say, well, Juneteenth isn't part of the Caribbean. It isn't part of Africa. We are African-Americans. Well, just like you said, anytime you see that red, you see us wherever it is. Anytime you see Juneteenth, you see liberation struggles wherever they are. So that's perfect. When we come back in a moment uh, with you, Doc, we're going to pick right up and ask you about that red drink. We're going to ask you about um, not only its significance, but where we see it, how it connects to Juneteenth, other red drink options. Um, and um, for those of you who have read the Washington Post article, she, Dr. Amon includes a recipe on how you can brew your own up. But uh, we'll be back in a moment here at the Black Table, Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Star Network. Here we are with the Black Table with our guest, Dr. Sunyata Amin, TEO of Calabash Tea and Tonic. And when we left, you led us right up to the door of that red drink that we see proliferate in Texas. And these Negroes is barbecuing whole hogs. They out here <laughs> doing all kinds. Of, I mean, <laughs> walk us through some of that food, Dr. Amin, because, you know, in addition to being intimately familiar with the foods of Africa and the diaspora and, and what is good for us, uh, you also um, talk a lot about the things that aren't so good for us and how sometimes mixing those things together can have detrimental uh, effects. But talk to us a little bit about this red drink that we see. We see red it. drink, fantastic. Red drink is pivotal to any celebration. Um, as you look throughout the diaspora, you will see red drink appearing over and over in different forms. Um, oh. This has everything to do with our connectivity with West Africa. So this, um, I mean, everywhere you go in it, let's, let's deal with, with Africa in general, right? I have a list here for you, right? We have Bissap in Senegambia. We have Sorrel in the Caribbean. We have Rosella in the Horn of Africa and Italy. It spread to Italy. <laughs> and the Middle East, they call it Rosella or the so-called Middle East arbitrary geopolitical term. Yes. Let's not forget that. Yes. Um, in uh, Egypt, it, uh, it, you're going to call it Karkade. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah, anytime we go to Egypt, I know you've been there many times, me too. We get off the plane looking for that Karkade. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, they're ready to give it to you. Because no it's, question. It's a celebration that you're coming home. Yes. And, yep. and, 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 and people, we, we always warn the folks to travel with us. If you're on blood pressure medicine, you better be careful because if that thing starts tasting good to you, you can mess up your medication because it, it lowers your blood pressure. It certainly does. It's yeah. a vasodilator. It opens the blood vessels and it releases heat from the body. It's a it's a coolant, as they call in an herb. There are certain herbs that are coolants. And so this throws heat off of your body. And that's one of the reasons why it remains popular in tr tropical and subtropical regions. And as we look at it translating over into different drinks here, but even used hibiscus is associated with cooling, with healing, with our ability to um, survive in unhuman, inhuman conditions uh, to be worked to death on plantations in high heats. So I still have some more. So yeah, some yeah I don't want to interrupt you. So, 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 so some That's of these other regions, like what, what's the name? What, what other names do we have? So in Central America, um, it is called Agua Fresca de Jamaica or Jamaica. And so it's called Jamaica because that was one of the main landing points of 
um, hibiscus and other herbals. And I assert that not just because my, my parents are Jamaican, but I assert that there's a, a history of maroonage in Jamaica and, and that connection from Queen Nanny and Kojo and all these other folks. And when we talk about their mastery of herbal medicine is because it was one of those places where the drum still existed and our connection to um, traditional spirituality, which includes herbal medicine. There's no way to separate it. So we also have in Brazil, we have vinagreta. Um, it can be found everywhere. I mean, you you see it over and over again. And as you mentioned, Dr. Carr, things that are great for us and some things that aren't so great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's life. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. And then so 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 then the folks brewing that red drink in whatever form they brew it in in Texas celebrating Juneteenth are cousins with all these other folks. We are all cousins. Um, when we talk about black food, I, I prefer that than African-American food. We could definitely talk about things that are specific to um, African-American cuisine. But we need to remember that we are one family and you'll see these themes over and over again. And it's an opportunity for us to understand each other and create those linkages to link back we were separated. It just depends on where those ships landed and, uh, you know, having been stolen from another place. And so we are also very connected. It's amazing. So when we think about that, um, like barbecue, Dr. Carr, you mentioned barbecue for Juneteenth. Yes. Yes. Um, the very word barbecue comes from the Arawak, the native Caribbean of, of which, you know, the Carib the Carib Indians, as we will call them, right? Carib Native American people, Arawak. Um, their word for barbecue is barbacoa. And so that's where the word barbecue came from or barbacoa. And so we can't separate at all. Like there's no way to separate our um, intrinsic relationships with Native American people that we interblended with literally, and then also from each other as descendants of um, African, you know, stolen folk. So, oh, man, this is I'm just so excited thinking about this because so many of us don't realize as black people how connected we are and how far back those traditions go. Uh, you wrote about all that red food that <laughs> is associated with Juneteenth, strawberry pie, barbecue, red rice, watermelon. Watermelon. <laughs> watermelon is so important to us and watermelon's gotten a bad rap, you know? Come on, redeem watermelon for us, Dr. Amin, today. <laughs> don't be ashamed of that watermelon, y'all. You know, there are people who say they won't eat it in public around mixed company, you know, in mixed company. They will not eat it in certain settings. Um, I've seen people eat watermelon with a knife and fork, my hand to God, if they're in a, I know. You petty bourgeois <laughs> Negroes put that knife and fork down and eat like your mom and them used to eat that watermelon. Why, why, why is watermelon so important, <laughs> Well, here's the thing. Fair enough, right? Chicken and watermelon are associated became associated with us in a very negative capacity. Yeah. And in the in the framework of that, um, I think personally that foods that we eat with our hands became villainized. So, you yes. know, things with a yes. bone in it, things that we pick up and eat, it seemed um, de classe because you're not using continental table manners, you know, mm -hmm. with a knife and a fork, which is more of us decolonizing our tongues, you know, pushing away from that and using our hands, learning to eat fufu, learning to to eat collard greens, picking it up. You go to some place in the South, people say it tastes better when you pick it up with your hand. <laughs> and <laughs> that's, become, that's the way we traditionally eat. All over the world, people do that, you know, and so when we look at our traditions of, of red foods, you know, red velvet cake and, and red punches, you go to the Caribbean, you got fruit punch served to you when you first get off the plane, just like you do in Africa, you get the kerkade, you get the sorrel, you get the bisap. Um, in the South, we have um, our own traditions and, you know, parts of my family that are from North Carolina went to Texas. And so you find that interconnectivity of people back and forth where red is a celebration. It says 
um, joyful resistance. It says we are still here and we deserve joy. And in the context of that, um, you know, commercial enterprises like how we mentioned Coke uh, and and other makers of soft drinks and hard drinks, right? So non-alcoholic and alcoholic drinks really started to recognize these black folks like this red drink and red foods. Yes. Let's see how we can color things with as much red as possible, whether it's candies and the Skittle and the, you know, all of this stuff, you know, the red sodas, big red and and um, Kool-Aid. Oh, you're my hitting, God. You're hitting too close to home, Dot. You're hitting too close. Oh, I mean, right. As a child, I'm thinking about red hots. I'm thinking about those. Co- In fact, it got so bad that we used to go to the store and we would ask for the the, the candies and the Kool-Aid by the color. Just give me the red. You want the red? Or the red? So are you telling me yeah. that this is a this is deliberate? This was a deliberate marketing campaign. Well, t- think about the fact, Dr. Carr, that we don't describe it as a flavor. No. It's not cherry and it's not strawberry, a lot, you know, and it's not it's not hibiscus flavor. It's red flavored. Right. <laughs> That's how much we love the color red, especially in the drinks and the candies, like being associated with our, it's it's in our soul. It's in our DNA. It's one of those DNA memories, um, those those places that are buried deep in us. So a, a company can sell you those little nasty. You remember those little uh, links that sat on the counter? Yeah. The, the, you know, growing up in New York, you had the bodega and it, they had the little, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it pulled it out of the thing. I was like, what is that? What is that? <laughs> and look, all, all, all the hood joints, I know, because, you know, all our Philly fam lived in Philly for a long time. Them quarter waters. It's a reason they tell it that way. You write about that in the article. <laughs> the the quarter, wa- quarter water. You got the um, the the Kool Aid is is a red. It's not even called the color it is. Kool Aid doesn't call it red. My God. We call it red. We call it red. What y'all call it in in in, in, in New York in, in in Philly? Call it water ice, but uh, they, they push. Oh. Like the Italian ice. Yeah, Italian ice. But it's like, yeah. Yeah, you, you call it by the color. <laughs> Give me the I red. want the blue. I want the red. The you red. Know, and you could tell because everyone would walk around with a red tongue. Oh, no you know, right. their tongue and their mouth was red. We didn't care, you know. And, and so when we talk about large food corporations recognizing our love for these things, Juneteenth factors into that in that so much of our celebration there in the Caribbean with um, Sorrel and, um, you know, pushing into our Northern uh, loves for red. It's like, they say, oh, wait a minute, we can market this as a thing specifically to people of color. You know, why don't we, uh, when we come back in our last section now, why don't we come back with the implications of this? Because as we know, this is all new territory for us. These rituals uh, that you have practiced and seen and inherited from uh, the Caribbean, from Latin America. Now this one here in the United States, Juneteenth, has been nationalized and and, in a kind of struggle over what it means to remember what it means. And we already see the first uh, forays into our community from these corporations as it relates to Juneteenth. So why don't we, when we come back uh, in our last segment, help uh, our viewers think through what it means to celebrate Juneteenth through the food, what it means to protect and extend our traditions, and how we can link our institutions so that we can always preserve the best of these rituals. So we'll be back with Dr. Sunyata Amin and We'll be talking more about Juneteenth and and these foods at the Black Table back in a moment. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network.
Welcome back to The Black Table. Greg Carr here on the Black Star Network, and we are honored today to be joined by Dr. Sonyata Amin, who is really helping us think through not only the history and meaning of Juneteenth, but the rituals, the foods, the icons, the shrines, the totems, everything culturally that is connected not only to that holiday, but it connects us as people uh, to the best in our traditions. Dr. Amin, you know, you, we, we're now both witness Certainly after everything shut down, you and the Calabash team went online and expanded. You know, a lot of people will be watching this from around the world, watching this broadcast. You led us right up to the horns of a dilemma now, because a lot of people are now going to be wanting to celebrate Juneteenth. I mean, I know that's one of the reasons that you wrote for a broader audience to help people in introduce people. But there are some pitfalls probably associated with that. Could you talk to us a little bit more about that? You started at the end of the the last segment talking about this, you know, the market coming in and saying, oh, we can we can exploit this. What do you see right. going forward? Uh, you know, this is a great question. Just like we see uh, traditional superfoods uh, making their way into the marketplace, uh, you name it, you know, matcha and maca and hibiscus and you know, mushroom and, you know, all of these foods that are now foraged, which we just call going out in the woods behind our house and grab <laughs> Your grandmother said, bring back that pokeweed and let's make a salad. Right. Yes. Um, so what we do see is things like this Juneteenth ice cream dust up that occurred um, where our foods start to get marketed back to us. They didn't even let that joint, no pun intended, cool off. They didn't let it cool off. How about that? <laughs> and it was too soon because because the, they, they received the black lash. <laughs> like, what? Juneteenth? But they're going to be back, aren't they? Oh, yeah, definitely. We're going to start to see more Juneteenth sales and lots of things revolving around food because that's a huge part of the tradition. And as we said, these red foods, we're going to see it more and more. And it's going to go in a soft, it's going to be a soft sell where it'll start with foods that we're accustomed to being red, like we talked about earlier. And then we're going to, it's going to move into certain kinds of product. And what ends up happening a lot of times is if they can get a black representative, then that person will introduce it um, and that's where they messed up, to be honest, with the ice cream. You, you know, it's funny you say it's, it's funny you say that, Doc. At, at the bill signing last year, they had Mother Opal Lee, the elder who is, you know, largely associated with helping, you know, push along with a lot of other folks. Yeah. And, and and we were standing there. Here's Congressional Black Caucus and the President of the United States signed that, Vice President Harris. And I'm standing in the back with the cast that guard the place, which is we know our black and brown people. And I'm standing between these two police officers, one young sister, she said, you know, I'm from Texas. We've been celebrating this all along. And, and the brother was like, right? I said, well, what y'all think is about to happen? And they both just shook their heads and started laughing. Right. I mean, I mean, I mean this, is a, this is a ritual like all the other ones you're describing. It's from the people. So how can we protect it? Happen. I mean, what, what are we talking about at this point? It definitely is. It's, it's one of our traditions and Texas is one of those pivotal places uh, in terms of how it got its name, how that celebration has has continued uh, for for all this time, and people need to acknowledge that. Um, what we look at as a, as a whole is that we do not want to be sold to in this consumer fashion. And when we examine it, when we zoom out macroscopically, we're being sold to all the time things that we have proclivities for. We have those proclivities. So what's happening is um, this will be the latest in, in that set of things. Um, and red foods had already been marketed to us, but now there'll be an excuse that takes it out of the quarter water and the now is the watermelon now <laughs> And the uh, and the hot link sausage on the counter and the so it'll it'll start shifting from the Kool Aid into more um, palatable you know sorbets and and you know things that seem a little classier than uh, what we were used to as children being marketed to and so we'll we'll see a push into into those spaces now what what I do think is fascinating is. 
uh, the amount of black chefs who are coming out with recipes who are saying, this is something to celebrate. Even if I'm not from Texas, I'm gonna give you what's from my place that is right along lines with that. Um, from the Caribbean, I'm gonna give you this sorrow because I will say that I feel like our love of hibiscus drinks, not the things marketed as red, has been pushed forward by Jamaicans and other Caribbean food places that were turned our traditions back to us on in in a, a North American and uh, you know like a North American capacity, and that's beautiful because it's just the snake swallowing its own tail. Sure. It, there is no beginning and no end. It only uh, exists in that capacity because we're from, uh, as, as descendants of the Caribbean, we're from a subtropical environment where that thing grows all the time. Yeah. So it's our responsibility to return the healthier version to our folks instead of just the red liqueurs marketed to us, the red sodas and the other things. I mean, why does the Kool-Aid man have to sound like Louis Armstrong. He's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. That's the do all. <laughs> right. That's true. No manners. No manners. No oh, manners. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is that? Wow. You know, that just, you know, man, you just really are sparking so many memories for me. I mean, we grew up watching that Kool Aid man bust through those brick walls. And until you said that, it never occurred to me the underlying cultural assumptions and stereotypes. And, you know, I remember many years ago reading Manny Marable's book, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America. And, and that was the first time I read about how the soft drink companies marketed those colors, red and purple and for the grape and, and red soda and how they really tapped into that market very deliberately and how black people were the consumers. And I, I know you know logos, about that. I mean, Dr. Carr, I mean, even their logos, McDonald's has red, Wendy's has red, KFC has red. I mean, uh, Popeyes and, you know, you name a uh, restaurant, Pizza Hut, any of it, red is pivotal to their marketing to us. Starbucks, green. Okay. So right. we have to know who is, who is green. On. Right. That's true. Whoa. Stop playing. Okay. So we got to come back. People are saying, you know what? I, I do want to ask you this before we go. You have been and continue to be one of the most successful and, and nuanced kind of bridge builders without sacrificing anything in terms of cultural integrity and foundation. You know, help us think through what we should be looking, not only what should we should be looking for, but how we can meet this moment in a way that enhances our communities. I mean, you're always looking to teach, regardless of anybody's background, their culture, their, and we know that this flood of commercialization is coming. How can we, you know, what should we do to meet this moment? And what are you all doing? In fact, at Calabasher, you know, you're an institution builder, you're an entrepreneur. How, how, how should we move in this, in this new environment, this new Juneteenth environment? This is fantastic. Uh, our entrepreneurial spirit, which we've always had, Right. Mm -hmm. This you go to West Africa, people have their market stalls. The market women run the economy. Right. And so when we talk about uh, reclaiming recipes, let's call it that reclaiming our recipes, the ingredients themselves, all of these things that are being sold and will be sold as heirloom grits and heirloom so and so. And it's only a matter of time. And we already saw it happen with this ice cream debacle. Um, what and, and the other yeah, products, right? Uh, what we have to do is decide to be those entrepreneurs, even in our own homes, reclaim the recipes, make these recipes, make them healthier versions of what we love, the same seasonings and such, but less Let's not cook something until it's uh, with an inch of its life, like make things more fresh, use the same season. And this gives us an opportunity to lower our blood pressure, avoid uh, uh, sugar diabetes, is sugar and diabetes issues, uh, our risk for cancer, et cetera. This is imperative because good health is not only your birthright, but it is also a revolutionary act. Yes. And as much as I fought this as a child, I am now getting it. This is, listen, y'all, 
you know, <laughs> here we are on the verge of the Juneteenth holiday. I don't think, I, I mean, you know, w- with the producers, we were talking before and, you know, they said, you know, let's move this to the, to the first of our two part conversation on Juneteenth. And, you know, thank you for doing this because it's going to be a lot of celebration. It's going to be a lot of noise. But when you watch this hour that we've spent with you today, this just resets the paradigm. It just strengthens us. And, and ultimately our health is a revolutionary act, huh? It absolutely is. It, it is intrinsic to our joy. And if it is true that every American citizen is due uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, our being able to live is pivotal to that entire flow. Otherwise, our quality of life is compromised. And that is a deliberate act with corporations. It's a deliberate underpinning of enslavement for so long and what we were forced to eat, what we had access to. Now we're at the place where we want to make sure that we uh, do the best we can for ourselves to increase our life and and well-being. Yes. Yes. Well, how can we continue to do that with you and with your team? at Calabash. I know one of the things that you and I are involved in building out the, the narrative platform, some other work we're doing is uh, we've been reading and discussing the work of Octavia Butler. And I know one of the new teas you've introduced is Octavia Butler at Calabash. Could you, could you, how can we continue to, uh, to support you and the team at Calabash team? What kind of, what kind of things you all into that we can share w- uh, with the black table audience today? Well, folks can pop on our website, uh, calabashtea.com. Folks can pop on our Instagram. We love being able to interact and answer questions. We are, as you know, we talked about these cultural custodians, like it or not, when we were younger. <laughs> and we, we've, we've walked it, we've leaned into it now at this point. And so that's part of it is also, you know, we have Harriet's Gun Tea and we have Garvey's Ghost and we have, Oct- actually, I was having Octavia this morning. We have <laughs> Octavia, Octavia Butler. Um, I love it. We have Oshun's Kiss. Like we love celebrating our traditional uh, ingredients. Uh oh. Uh-oh. You know, I, got the, I got the little joint. I'm gonna come get my re up. I got the big joint. <laughs> of course you do. You made it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Um, you love cel- we love celebrating you. About to say. Yeah. Well, I love the ability to celebrate our ancestors and the people we should give flowers to now. Yes. Um, you know, through the foods. And that is how we f- traditionally function, right? So when we talk about um, our con- our ties and connections to traditional Yoruba and traditional Akan and all of the things that some- somehow we had to leave a lot of that, we still have it and we can still reconnect. So we're here, you know, we love at Calabash being able to have, your- we your cousins, Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Amin, uh, we want to thank you, uh, the whole oh. Black Star Network and the Black Table in particular for spending this time with us and helping us prepare for the Juneteenth holiday and beyond that for really recentering ourselves, for decolonizing our tongues, for healing us. And uh, we hope you'll come back and join us very soon. I but- appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to wrap for now and I'll be back to clear the table in a moment here at the Black Star Network and prepare for next week when we will continue this conversation and put it in a larger geopolitical context with our brother, Dr. Gerald. Back in a moment. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Welcome back to the Black Table on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr. 
And we've spent the last hour with Dr. Sunyata Amin, physician, herbalist, institution builder, entrepreneur, and she's given us a master class on not only the ritual we call Juneteenth, but the deeper significance of how people of African descent use the foods of Juneteenth, connecting them to the foods of Africa and her diaspora as revolutionary acts of self-preservation. One of the things that when you visit uh, Sunyata's store, when you visit her institution, Calabash, when you walk in, anyone who greets you will say, how can we heal you today? Well, as I said at the beginning of the show, when George Floyd became an ancestor and transitioned to the ancestors, a lot of people didn't know that he had come uh, from Texas, from Jack Yates High School. Jack Yates, one of the founders of Juneteenth in Houston, who had come from North Carolina, like Dr. Amon's uh, ancestors, like George Floyd's own mother, and that they connect to a long and large arc of Maroonage and resistance. Juneteenth is a ritual of resistance, a revolutionary act. And so we wish everybody a happy Juneteenth holiday. And more and most importantly, we wish everybody a moment to pause, to recenter, to renew, to decolonize your tongue, to heal, and to prepare ourselves for the work that remains. So we'll see you next week back at the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. <laughs>